Albert Michelson designed the first experiment, which demonstrated that no ether was required for light to propagate. He achieved a terrestrial version of the thought experiment derived by, from Maxwell, namely to look at the propagation of light both upstream or upwind and downwind of the ether. Now, Michelson heard about Maxwell's desire to experimentally test the ether because he, like Todd, was at the U.S. Naval Academy. Michelson would go on to become the first American to win the Nobel Prize. In his 20s, he had become well known for a, me a measurement apparatus to accurately measure the, sp the speed of light C, and he improved that apparatus in order to ac accomplish the test for the ether. The terrestrial experiment again had a light source and would reflect it off of a mirror. In the experiment, we again suppose that Earth and the, thus the light source and the mirror are moving through an ether at speed v. If we shine the light from the light source onto the mirror and then it reflects back, we can measure the time for it to, to make the, the outbound and return flight. Because the whole system is moving at speed v through the ether, then the light going upstream will be traveling at speed v plus c, and the light stream heading backstream, uh, downstream will be sp traveling at speed v minus c. When we try to make a measurement, we are measuring the time for the light to, to go out and return. This time will be equal to L over V minus C plus L over V plus C. Or finding a common denominator, this is 2LC over C squared minus V squared. Or 2L over C divided by 1 minus this quantity V over C squared. There's a familiar formula with the quantity 1 minus 1 minus x squared is approximately equal to 1 plus x squared. As a result, the expression shown of 2L over C minus, oh, divided by 1 minus V over C squared is approximately equal to 2L over C times the quantity 1 plus the square of V over C. Since V over C is approximately 10 to the minus 4, we're looking for a 10 to the minus 8 correction in this time due to the ether. That's a very challenging measurement to make. Michelson designed a two-arm spectrometer. In this spectrometer, a beam splitter located right here takes the light from a source and splits it off into two different tracks. One track heads toward mirror L M1. The other track, which is reflected from the beam splitter in the opposite direction, heads toward a mirror M2. So there's M2 and there's M1. If the entire apparatus is moving through the ether along the axis, let's say, a parallel to X M1, then the ether wind looks like a velocity heading this way at speed v. And we can immediately expect an alteration in the amount of time for the light to travel down to L1 and then return. But what happens to the light that's heading up here to mirror M2? Is the time shifted for that mirror? Or is it retarded or in advanced in any way? It turns out even light heading toward mirror number two is going to be slowed down because of the motion of the system through the ether. The speed of light going to M2 is no longer C because of the Galilean addition of velocities. C is the, light, is the speed at which light reflects off the mirror, but since mirror M2 is moving forward with speed V in through the ether, then there's a speed V prime which represents the, the relative velocity between the, the light and the mirror M2. And by using this little right triangle, we see that V prime is the square root of C squared minus V squared. We can think of it in this way, that 
the speed of C should be the, light, the speed of light as it's trying to rush toward the mirror, except the mirror is rushing away from the light source. And so that rel slows down the relative speed between the pulse of light and the mirror. Therefore, the time T2 for the light to go out to mirror 2 and then return back to the beam splitter is 2L2 over V prime, which works out to be 2L over L2 over C divided by the square root of 1 minus V squared over C squared. So how much is the light retarded between these two arms? We can compare the relative amount of time elapsed and we'll call that delta T. That's the difference in time to propagate between toward mirror M1 and back and mirror 2 and M2 and back. This works out to be the following formula again using that approximate set of expansions. And here we use a second expansion that 1 over square root of 1 plus x squared is roughly equal to 1 minus 1 half x squared. This works out to 2 L2 minus L1 minus L2 over C plus 2 L1 V squared over C cubed minus L2 V squared over C cubed. Michelson had a particular trick in that his entire apparatus was mounted on a turntable. It could be rotated. And thus, he could change which mirror was pointing along the alleged ether wind. He could rotate the system 90 degrees so that M2 would be along the ether wind and M1 would be perpendicular to it. In this case, the, the lengths L1 and L2 in these formulae would swap. Then he could measure the time difference delta t in the original orientation and delta t prime in the subsequent orientation after rotating the table. The rotation of the table effectively swaps the two lengths L1 and L2. In this case, then the difference between delta t and delta t prime is the sum of those two lengths times v squared over c cubed. In other words, that's a difference that's proportional to the speed through the ether wind. If we assume that the arms of the spectrometer are approximately a meter in length and the velocity is about 20 kilometers per second, this time difference is approximately one femtoseconds. That's too challenging for most instrumentation even today. Instead, Michelson had to use the idea of wave superposition to measure this time lag. The waves traveling to M1 and M2 are initially in phase, which means there's a wave pulse or a wave train traveling toward the beam splitter. And that wave train has the same crests and troughs happening in sequence or in, in phase as they head toward M1 and M2. But because M, the propagation to M1 and M2 But because the propagation to M1 and M2 are slightly at different speeds, then the waves reflect, reflected off those mirrors and heading back toward the telescope at location T will be slightly out of phase with, re with respect to one another. In that case, they can either constructively or destructively interfere. Remember that wave interference can be constructive. This happens when two wave fronts happen to have their crests at the same location or time and their troughs at the same time, which is to say that they're in phase. The superposition of these two wave fronts is another wave front whose amplitude is twice as large. It only happens when the two waves are in phase, which is to say that they are either not delayed relative to one another or if they are delayed, they're out of phase by exactly a multiple of a period. It's also possible for wave interference to be destructive. If the first wave is phase shifted relative to the second wave such that the crests of the first wave co coincide in time with the troughs of the second wave, then when these two add together, the amplitude will be dampened out or near zero. This is referred to as 
destructive superposition or destructive interference. And it occurs whenever the two wavefronts are either a half a period out of phase or an odd multiple of t over 2 out of sync with one another. In this case, the light will be considerably less bright. Michelson looked for the cancellation or superposition of the light in his, in his interferometer. He also expanded the length of the spectrometer arms by having the light reflect back and forth multiple times across the table. This effectively made the length of the arms very, very long, as much as 100 meters. The following table summarizes a series of measurements over 50 years trying to look for the shift of the speed of light due to the propagation through the ether. Here was a Michelson's original measurement with a spectrometer arm length of approximately 120 centimeters. The phase shift expected, assuming a 20 kilometer length of speed through the ether and, and red light, was about 0.04 wavelengths or 0.04 periods. And yet, what was observed is that nothing bigger than 0.02 could be seen. The ratio is two, is 2, which is to say that the ether should have existed, should have produced an effect twice as big as anything as the upper limit as what they saw. That's not too convincing, although it was suggested that there's no ether. A subsequent experiment six years later greatly exp expands, expanded the length of the spectrometer arms. And now, instead of being approximately a meter in length, they were 11 meters in length. In this case, the effect due to the ether should have been magnified to be 0.4 wavelengths in shift. And instead, still a better measurement of 0.01 was the upper limit. And now, the ether should have produced an effect 40 times bigger than anything I've seen. And this was very strong evidence that no ether exists. Measurements which followed Michelson and Morley tried to improve this, this apparatus even further to make the spectrometer length uh, much longer, 32 meters, and to pursue, per, improve the upper limit on the apparatus to, as to the maximum detectable uh, phase shift, either 0.01 or in some cases later on 0.0004. In no case has any evidence for the ether ever been found.